Home Burial, first published in 1914, is one of Robert Frost's longest poems. Written in blank verse, and mostly in dialogue, the poem centers on the peril and pain of miscommunication. The characters, a husband and wife who have recently buried their child, cope with grief very differently and can't understand or respect each other's mourning process. By the poem's conclusion, the title has taken on a double meaning, referring not only to the grave of the couple's dead son but also to the likely death of their love and their marriage. Language and communication are central to home burial, which focuses on a couple's failure to understand each other in the wake of their child's death. This breakdown in communication, even more than their grief itself, threatens to destroy the couple's marriage, as neither person is able to recognize, let alone empathize with, the other's pain and perspective. That the couple's inability to listen to one another ultimately leads to an unresolved shouting match hammers home at the poem's message that communication is vital to the survival and success of any relationship. Despite the poem's extensive use of dialogue, the husband and wife never seem to truly hear each other over the course of the poem. The poem starts out with the husband apparently trying to understand his wife better, there's something I should like to ask you, dear, but the fact that he ignores his wife's repeated requests to drop the subject indicates he is not really listening. In return, his wife rejects her husband's plea to find a way to talk about their grief, characterizing what he has to say as, sneering, and accusing him of not, knowing, how to speak. Crucially, she also implies that she does not believe any words or language can begin to capture the depth of her grief, a mindset that makes any attempt at communication impossible from the start. In short, neither spouse is willing to give the other's perspective full attention or respect. Both are more eager to air their own grievances than hear the others out. This communication breakdown only heightens the conflict between the two, leading them both to leap to assumptions about the other's depth of grief. For example, even as he requests that she, give him his chance, the husband accuses his wife of, overdoing, it a little, with her, mother loss, her maternal grief. For her part, the wife excoriates her husband for his behavior on the day of their son's burial, which she interprets as insufficiently mournful. Unsurprisingly, these accusations only fan the flames of the couple's argument, making communication between the two of them even harder, and creating a cycle of anger and misunderstanding that seems impossible for them to escape. The hints throughout the poem that the wife is taking her grief elsewhere, don't go to someone else this time. Listen to me, the husband pleads, only further emphasize that this is an argument the couple has had over and over, without any progress or breakthrough. The cost of this miscommunication is devastatingly high. As the poem's conclusion illustrates, the couple's marriage is at a breaking point. The wife threatens to leave, and her husband threatens to drag her, back by force. Tragically and ironically, in the final lines, he shouts, where do you mean to go? First tell me that, he is still trying fruitlessly to talk or shout things out, even though his wife has made clear this approach will not work for her. Their inability to even communicate about their different communication needs, he's seeking the right words, while she wishes words were not on the table at all, emphasizes how vital it is to a couple's success that the two partners be able to express themselves to one another. This couple cannot even begin tackle their shared grief over the loss of their child, the pain at the source of their marriage's rupture, without first learning to listen to and speak with each another. Homburial, as the title suggests, is a poem concerned with death. The poem revolves around a husband and wife who are coping with the death of their first child very differently, and who wrestle with their seemingly irreconcilable approaches to grief. The poem does not favor one grieving process over the other, but it does capture how the couple's inability to recognize, respect, or empathize with their partner's individual response to the tragic loss of their child leads to pain and conflict. Throughout the poem, the wife's approach to grief is depicted as deeply emotional and still quite raw. The poem opens with her standing at a window at the top of the stairs. What is it you see, from up there always? Her husband asks, only to discover she has been keeping constant watch over their son's grave. She shuts down his attempts to discuss their shared loss, and seeks again and again to escape the conversation, ultimately condemning her husband for, thinking, the talk is all. Her grief, she implies, goes beyond words, and is so profound that she cannot begin to understand those who, mock e the best of their way back to life, after a loved one's death. For the wife, the loss of a child is a blow so great that one can never recover from it. 
The husband takes a much more active approach to grief. He literally buries their child with his own hands, and afterwards is able to talk about his everyday concerns with funeral goers, much to his wife's horror. Though he does initially try to understand his wife's mourning process, let me into your grief, he asks his ability to move on from this great loss renders him unable to fully empathize with or accept his wife's slower approach. At one point, he even suggests she is taking mother loss of a first child too hard. Unsurprisingly, then, the couple's conversation escalates over the course of the poem into full-blown argument, as they each criticize and condemn the other's grieving process rather than seeking to understand or empathize with it. You make me angry, God, what a woman, the husband explodes, while his wife sneers that he hasn't, any feelings, and, couldn't care, about their son's death at all. In short, their different ways of mourning are seemingly incompatible. Importantly, however, though the poem does not shy away from the couple's mismatched mourning styles, it presents both approaches to grief as equally valid. The breakdown in the couple's marriage, therefore, is not the result of one or the other pursuing the wrong approach to death and loss, but rather because of both partners' unwillingness to extend empathy or respect toward the other's grieving process. Fittingly, the poem ends at an impasse, with the wife attempting to leave the house and her husband threatening to bring her back by force. The poem offers no hope of resolving the pain and conflict between the two of them, lending these final lines an ominous undertone that suggests their marriage is as dead as the child buried in the graveyard. Gender affects every aspect of the relationship between the two characters in Home Burial, as well as their approaches to grief and loss. Written in the early 20th century, the poem invokes traditional, even stereotypical, gender roles, focusing on a dominant, stoic husband and an emotional wife. Crucially, the characters themselves believe in and consistently invoke these same stereotypes, further complicating their struggle to understand one another. Intentionally or not, the poem thus demonstrates some of the dangers of rigid gender stereotypes. Gender shapes how the husband and wife approach the poem's central conflict, how to grieve a lost child. The husband relies on dominance and physical force, two stereotypically masculine attributes. For instance, at the poem's opening, he, Mount S, the stairs, until his wife cower S under him, and commands her to tell him why she stares out the window. In contrast, his wife takes what might be called a stereotypically feminine approach. She resists and undermines her husband, weeps, and uses her emotions as weapons. The characters justify their behavior by invoking deeply rooted gender norms. A man must partly give up being a man with women folk, the husband says in explanation of his difficulty accessing more vulnerable emotions. Similarly, his wife dismisses the notion that men can feel grief the way women do, I don't know rightly whether any man can. Thus, these characters not only act on but deeply trust in stereotypes about men and women, setting them up for misunderstanding and miscommunication from the get-go. No surprise, then, that gender norms have also greatly affected the couple's different approaches to grief. The husband, for instance, sees his wife's long-lasting response to the loss of their son as overdoing it a little, whereas she is appalled at his repressed response, suggesting he does not have any feelings at all and indeed couldn't care about their son's death as much as she does. But try as both characters might to pin the blame of their troubled marriage on each other's gendered faults, God, what a woman, the husband exclaims, who is that man? I didn't know you, the wife laments, the poem on the whole suggests that it is their inability to communicate, not gender differences, that is the true source of their troubles. Both characters' perspectives receive an equal share of the poem's attention, and the text does not suggest that one approach to grief is better or worse than the other. Rather, it is the couple's reliance on stereotype, their assumptions about each other, that keeps them in the dark about each other. In other words, gender need not be an obstacle between the two of them, except that this couple lets it be, using gender stereotypes as an excuse for their mistrust and misunderstanding of each other.